today's scripture reading is Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which, this is, the, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Every follows, okay? Special time that we need as we celebrate together. I wanted to play that silently like that because I wanted you to think about the sentiments that were expressed there. If you're a father, I want to ask that you stand. I want to offer, offer a blessing you have. Let's go to God and pray. Lord, we're so very thankful how much you love us, and we thank you, dear Lord, for this very precious time that we have to be together. And we special thank you, dear Lord, for the special time that we've set aside to honor fathers. And I pray, dear Lord, for these men that are standing here. I thank you, dear Lord, for them. I pray, dear Lord, that you will give them the strength and the courage and their love for you to be and lead their families as you've called them to do. We thank you, dear Lord, for that opportunity. And we know, dear Lord, that you've designed it to be so very necessary within our families. And I pray, dear Lord, you continue to stand with them and give them the courage they need. Lord, we do thank you for our families. We thank you, dear Lord, for the institution of family. And we pray, dear Lord, each one of us will continue to invest in our families. That truly, dear Lord, we can glorify you. For 
Lord, family, in a small way, reflects your community. And we pray, dear Lord, you help us realize that. Lord, in all things, you be glory. Thank you, dear Lord, for your love and mercy and grace. Please guide us and be with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated now. I mean, I love that Caleb has read the scripture this morning. Wasn't that precious? I just love that. You know, we've set aside this time for fathers, but it, again, and I say this a great deal, Father's Day is very different from Mother's Day. I mean, I walked in a stopping shop, and on Mother's Day, there was four racks of cards. I don't know if you went to a stopping shop. There were two small racks of cards dedicated, that's all. Just two small racks dedicated to Father's Day. You know, at times in our society, we've sometimes downgraded the role of fathers within the family. And I'm very thankful that recently more and more research has been done in the sense of showing how much fathers are needed within the family. I came across this paper and I just want to share a few things from it with you. It says, the impact of fatherhood is not subjective, but objective and documented phenomena. So far as they know, the kids who grow up with a present engaged father are less likely to drop out of school or wind up in jail. When kids have close relationships with father figures, they're less likely to have sex at a young age and tend to avoid other high-risk behaviors. They're more likely to have healthy, stable relationships when they grow up. They also tend to have fewer psychological problems throughout their lives when fatherhood is taken seriously. It goes on to say, when fathers are actively involved with their children, children do better. Paul Amato, sociologist who studies parent-child relationship at uh, Pennsylvania State University says, all of this research suggests that fathers are important for a child's development. But how fathers interact with their children and how mothers interact with their children are different. It's the nature of the role. And that's why a Father's Day sermon is different from a Mother's Day sermon. I mean, Nick asked the question, are we going to get flowers today? And I would say just the opposite. Because basically my message to fathers today is buck up, cupcake. <laughs> it's time to get in the game and be a father. Let's we'll start with the text that, uh, that Caleb read. Begin at verse 1 there of Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. We're told to respect and obey our parents. And if fathers have led their families as God has called them to do, then their children will be respectful and obedient. It's interesting to me that God sets up as a, as a test, basically, of those who would lead within the body, because very much the body reflects a family unit. And Paul gets across that one has to have led well in his family in order to be have the right to lead the body of Christ. One of the qualifications of an elder is if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Does it manage his own family well and see that his children obey with him in proper respect? Because as Paul says in our text, this is right. I think it's interesting that both the qualifications of elders and deacons is that before they can lead, as I mentioned, they must be good leaders within their home. That's the test. <clears throat> I mean, Paul goes on to say in that text, there. He goes on to say in that text there, is that if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? You know, to be an elder, you have to have led and nurtured your family spiritually. Matter of fact, you've had, you need to have led children to faith to become Christians. Because it's a test. 
The test, if you've invested, you know how to spiritually help somebody mature spiritually. <clears throat> Paul says in Colossians 3, verse 20, Children, obey your parents and everything, for this pleases the Lord. I mean, discipline is vital in developing our children in this important role for us as fathers. Matter of fact, someone said this, good fathers set limits and are firm. And one of the reasons why, one of the ways we know how to father is we look to our heavenly father. And we see how he interacts with mankind. And that basically sets for us a model. And we realize that God, what God does is that he sets limits. He has boundaries. And he disciplines. The Hebrew writer says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as sons. See, God trains us and disciplines us. Because why? Because he loves us and sets boundaries that we as fathers need to set within our own families. Because that's the way we'll demonstrate love and security. It's interesting to me that Hebrew writer goes on to say in verse 9, it says, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? So a vital role that we as fathers play is disciplining our children, setting boundaries. Paul Faulkner notes this. Current research validates that not only is it appropriate discipline, appropriate discipline is not harmful, but essential to the happiness and well-being of your children. We must correct our children, but we must do it in love. But there is a scripture I've always held to that I've always wanted to put on my refrigerator. <laughs> Proverbs 30, verse 17. The eye that mocks a father that scorns the obedience to a mother will be pecked out by ravens of the valley and will be eaten by the vultures. <laughs> See, I've always wanted to have that on my, on my refrigerator <laughs> and remind my children that you know, that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Brothers and fathers, one of the things you need to realize is the respect that you give to each other. Very much will be reflected in your children and how they interact with people. And I'm very thankful, so very thankful, that I learned to obey and respect my parents through their loving and firm <clears throat> discipline. It made a difference in my life. So fathers, time to buck up. It's time to get in the game and teach your children to obey and respect their mother and you. But that's a charge that God has given us. Look at verse 2, Ephesians. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with our promise. Honor means to there to revere, to treat as valuable, as precious. This comes from the Ten Commandments. Deuteronomy 5, verse 16. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so it may go well, so you may live long, and that you may go well with you in the land the Lord your God has given you. God has told his people to honor and hold in high esteem their parents. Matter of fact, verse 3 goes on to say that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. I think it's interesting, Romans chapter 1 talks about the idea that one of the signs of depravity and godlessness is disrespecting our parents. And a father's role is critical. And 
Helping our children have healthy respect and understanding of authority and responsibility. That's one of the things that God has charged us to do as fathers. For children that are not taught to honor and respect their parents, oftentimes grow up to be adults who are prideful, disrespectful, and unwilling to follow the others. And that is not the attitude that God's charged us to instill. Paul wrote in Titus 3, remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever's good, to slander no one, to be peaceful and considerate, and to show true humility towards all men. And fathers, you play a large role in the lives of your children of instilling this attitude. And so fathers, buck up. Get in the game. And teach your children how they need to respect and honor God. Of course, the parents. But also others in their lives. For God has charged us to instill this in their lives. But I want to ask you a question. Something that's near and dear to my heart. Do you honor and respect your parents? I'm asking everybody that. Do you honor and respect your parents? Of course, this is something that takes place not only in childhood, but all our lives. It's fascinating that in Matthew chapter 15, that Jesus calls the Pharisees on the carpet because as adults, they were not honoring their parents. And Jesus told them the text by not taking care of their elderly parents, they were not honoring their parents. We are charged by God to honor our parents. Paul made this statement in 1 Timothy 5, verse 4. If a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice. How do you put their religion into practice when it comes to that matter? By caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. So the one of the ways we're pleasing to God is by honoring our parents all their lives. Caring for them, taking care of their needs, dealing with them as we go along. Because honoring, respecting our parents involves much more than giving a card and giving a call. It involves caring for them financially, it involves <coughs> caring for them in their physical needs, however. <coughs> <clears throat> it goes on in our text there, verse 4, by saying, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training instruction of the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate. Uh, one text is, do not provoke to wrath. <clears throat> the word implies being so heavy-handed and unreasonable with children that they're driven to a helpless state of frustration and anger. Paul says there in Colossians 3, verse 21, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. I mean, Paul admonishes fathers to be careful in their use of authority, that it's healthy. Because an improper use of authority can defeat any instruction you give. If all you do is frustrate them. And fathers, we have to be honorable to work hard to stay in control, expressing love as we discipline. Yet, all too often, I often see the other extreme. And that is we're not willing to discipline at all. Sometimes in our discipline, we're too timid or reluctant, fearful of incurring the wrath of our children. where we're constantly seeking the approval of our children 
and we avoid any discipline that displeases them. Both are wrong. God has called us to lead our families. God has called us to discipline and to have a framework for them to work from. But do it in love. That they may feel secure and may learn. One person said this. Without discipline, love is incomplete. Without love, discipline is irrelevant. So, Father, it's time to get in the game and correct your children with discipline balanced with love. See, isn't it interesting in the text that Paul has there that God has called us as fathers to have the responsibility of training our children spiritually. That he's told us to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. That we're charged to fill their lives with God's word. That we have the responsibility to make sure that takes place in our families. Of course, to be able to do that, we've got to know God's word. We've got to be able to reflect. We can't reflect what we don't know. And so we're going to have to be students of God's word and to be able to share that and nurture that. That's our charge. God says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. God has called us to make sure as leaders within the family that we fill our community, our lives, our families with God's word. That our children are exposed to it. That they know it. That they hear it. That's the charge God's given us. Not mom, but you. <clears throat> and we need to realize, of course, the most important teaching tool will be our example. They're going to be judging Christianity. They're going to be judging truth by what they see in you. Because you could talk it all you want, but if you're not living it, it's going absolutely nowhere. Again, go back to that article. Perhaps the most importantly, dads need to realize that their kids are always watching. And what they do matters. Amato says, fathers might ask themselves, what are my children learning about life in general? About morality? About how family members should treat one another? About relations from observing me every day? Because that's the biggest lesson story. So fathers, get into the game. And realize we need to teach a model for your children what the Christian walk looks like. As they see it play out. But that is what God has charged us to do. This is an interesting text. In 1 Thessalonians 2, it goes, For you know, and this is Paul talking to Thessal the Thessalonians, For you know that we dealt with each other, uh, each of you, as a father deals with its own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who called you into his kingdom and glory. You hear what Paul's saying? Paul is saying basically that his role that he was playing with the Thessalonians was the idea that he was being their spiritual cheerleader. Encourage him along. And really as fathers, see, we need to be our children's cheerleaders in life. We need to be encouraging them. We need to be supporting them. We need to be consoling them and comforting them when they fail. We 
We need to be fathers. Fathers that get into the game and be your children's cheerleaders in life, especially as they grow up and stumble on their own Christian walk. But that is what God has called us to do. See, one of the things that you realize when you realize the role that we play as fathers is that we are to be engaged in the lives of our children. We can't be distant. We can't stand at arm's length. We can't let mom lead it all. We're called to lead. We're called to set the tone. We're called to be people of God that try to instill that same love is it our children? Paul, talking to Thessalonians, says, We encourage you, we comforted you, we kept urging you to live the kind of life that pleases God. Let me go back to that article. A lot goes into being a solid father. <clears throat> These studies all emphasize the importance of not just parenting, but parenting well. Not just being present and doing what the study suggests, but legitimately caring for your children, <laughs> modeling good behavior. That's what God's called us to do. Now realize each of our situations are different. But all we can do is do the very best to try to be the fathers that God has called us to be. That's all we can do. But we've got, it's intentful. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to fall in your lap. You've got to be intentful about being that person. Of leading. Because God has charged us fathers to train to admonish, to discipline, to instruct, and nurture our children in the Lord. And fathers are to model what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and be our children's spiritual cheerleaders as they begin their own journey. That's the charge. On Mother's Day, we offer flowers, nice poems, and sweet things. On Father's Day, we offer a charge to buck up and be the father that God has called you to be. Because you know what? We as men react differently. We'll take a charge. We'll take a challenge, an objective, a hill to take on. God has given us that. God has given us a charge. He's given us a hill to take. He's given us an objective to move forward to. To be the man, to be the person, to lead. And mothers and wives, you need to be your husband's cheerleader. So you could berate him. You could talk bad about the things he's not doing. I guarantee you he will not be a better father by you doing that. But if you lift him up, if you praise him, if you'll encourage him, he will always work hard to look even better in your eyes. Happy Father's Day. And it's time to get to work. And it's time to get in the game. It's time to lead our families. As God has called us to. Let's stand and sing a song. This is my Father's world. And to my
seated. The invitation slug is 389. <clears throat> As I was thinking about this and thinking about the message, I was reminded of Joshua's sermon before the end of his life. And I really think as fathers, we need to adopt that same attitude that Joshua has there. When he said there in Joshua 24, verse 15, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will yourself, whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Amen. See, that is the attitude that as a God calls for us as fathers to have, that says no matter what, we will serve the Lord. I will lead. You can't force people sometimes, but you go yourself. You set the priority. You set the tone. You be God's children. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. And that's the attitude that God has called for us as we lead our family. <laughs> A commitment to them that God will always come first. And we will have that as a family. But God will always be first. For that's the charge he's given us. That's the tone we need to set. Because in reality, that's the tone that should have been set in each one of our lives when we obeyed the gospel. That for us, I will serve the Lord. God will come first. When we made the decision that we believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that because of that we're willing to change the direction of our lives and repent. We're willing to confess that fact that we believe Jesus is Lord for the rest of our lives. And submit ourselves to the water grave of baptism where we die. It's no longer about us. You know, sometimes that's the mantra we've got to have playing in our head. It's not about me. And realize it's about him and live our lives serving him. If you have need of invitation, I invite you to come now as we stand and sing.